All right, welcome. Let's get started. Um, we're going to be using computers quite a bit over the next couple of weeks, and so I see that most students have them today. Uh, please also bring it to class on Friday. And then looking a little bit more uh, into the future more, on Wednesday we're scheduled to have quiz two. That quiz is going to have a question where you'll need to use Excel in order to solve it. And so uh, please bring, bring your laptop on that day. If you don't have one, you can borrow one from a family member or, as I mentioned in the email I sent out earlier today, at the library circulation desk they have an option where you can check out a laptop computer from them. Apparently they've got about 25 laptops that you can check out. So um, please bring computers pretty consistently in, until I tell you we're done for now. Also, homework aid is due on Monday the 10th. So last time we talked about internal rate of return, and today we're discussing a, a related concept, which is external rate of return, and then we're also going to be getting into bond investments. Uh, so before we do that, are there any questions related to the announcements? All right. Let's begin by looking at this picture. Let me dim the lights on the other side so you guys can see that all right. So for just a moment, this is going to be art appreciation course, all right? Anybody know what class or what other door? Go, go in the other door. Anybody know what the, uh, the name of this painting is? It's, it's called When Will You Marry? And um, I mean, I'd never seen it before I looked up what's the, uh, the most expensive painting ever sold, and this is it. So this is the most expensive painting ever sold. Anybody want to guess what, it, what its value was? It sold in February of 2015, so it's relatively recent. Any guesses? 65 million. Too low. Good guess, though. How much? 150? A billion. Well, no, it wasn't a billion dollars. But it was 300 million for this painting. $300 million. It was sold by a uh, Swiss businessman to the ruling family of Qatar. All right. $300 million in February 2015. The original sales price back in 1893 was 1,500 French francs, which um, if you look at the gold exchange rates back then would translate into about 750 US dollars. And then if you look at inflation over time, in today's terms, that's $20,000. Welcome. Glad you could make it. Anybody know if it's 12 yet? 15 seconds? I think that the clock on this computer must be wrong, because I was going by this. It says 12.04 here. Well, I apologize. I'll have to ask IT about setting the clock on this. All right. Honestly, I'm sorry about that. OK, so you missed. This is the most expensive painting in the world. And uh, 300, billion uh, $300 million. And so if you had bought it, in today's terms, it was $20,000. So uh, that's, that's obviously a very good return on investment. Whoever purchased it, it's not the same guy, because it was originally sold in 1892. And so it's a pretty old painting, but it's been in this, it was, in the Swiss family for um, more than 60 years they held on to it. And so I don't think they paid the original purchase price, but it's certainly appreciated a lot more recently. So we're going to come back to this idea of some things you can invest in that you can keep earning the returns periodically and reinvest, um, like a savings account, and then other things like a rare painting you can't, because once you have sold the painting, you can't take the profits from that sale and invest them someplace else. So last time we were talking about internal rate of return. And uh, internal rate of return is where you um, are trying to find out if you are a yes or a no on a project. Um, so the, uh, the MAR, the minimum acceptable rate of return, is based on your borrowing costs, based on the return that you want to earn from your own investments. And um, what you can use it for is not comparing alternatives, because it's not necessarily true that the project with the highest IRR is the most favorable to you. But it is true that the project with the highest IRR um, 
if it's above the MAR, is an acceptable project. Any project with an IRR above the MAR is acceptable. So this is the only way we can use the IRR. And so the internal rate of return, uh, an example of a project when the reinvestment uh, requirement is valid is for a savings account. But for a thing like a rare painting or any other project where you can't reinvest your earnings back into the same item, you should calculate something called the external rate of return. And the external rate of return acknowledges the fact that some earnings can't be reinvested into the original item and have to be put someplace else. So this example of a rare painting. Once you have sold the rare painting, you can't buy it again and earn the same return on investment that you got the first time around. And so what you have to do instead is take revenues and put them in a, market, a money market account or into a savings account or some other thing. And so the external rate of return that we're going to be working with today has two different interest rates. Now let me give you a warning that the two topics for today's class, external rate of return and bonds, are by far the, uh, the two things that students struggle the most on in exams. And so if you want to pay extra attention today, I think it'll be worth your time because it seems like the two topics we're discussing today are the things that in exam two students do the most poorly on. So let's talk more about external rate of return. Uh, the external rate of return uses what's called an external reinvestment rate. And the, uh, the variable that we assign to the external rate, uh, reinvestment rate is I sub I. Some texts call it epsilon, but we'll just call it I sub I, the external reinvestment rate. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, the external reinvestment rate. And so what that is is if you, for example, um, have a business and all of the profits that come from that business go into a secondary account, this is the interest rate that is paid by the secondary account, this external reinvestment rate. So it's the rate that cash flows can be reinvested at. Now, um, to find the external rate of return, what you have to do is, first of all, discount all of the outflows from your project to time zero. And we'll go over this during an in-class exercise today. The reason why I asked you to bring your laptops is because we're going to be applying this method. First of all, discounting all the outflows to the present. Then you're taking all the inflows to the future, to the end of the cash flow diagram. So all of the money above the line, inflows, goes to the future. All of the money below the line, meaning the outflows, are discounted to the present. And then you relate the two. And the relationship between the future inflows and the present outflows, you solve for an interest rate. And it's an iterative solution. It's something that you can do with goal seek. And that's the external rate of return. And the variable that we use for external rate of return is I prime. Um, so here's a graphical representation of the procedure. You start off with the cash flow diagram like this. And so you can see this cash flow diagram has both inflows and outflows. The, the money that you have to pay are these arrows that are down. And so what you do is you move all of the outflows to the present, one single present value. All of the inflows, all of the revenue, has been taken to the, uh, to the future. You'll notice that one of these years has both outflow and inflow. What you have to do there is find the net amount for that year. So you wouldn't move this one single um, outflow to the present. Instead, you would subtract the outflow from the inflow, and it looks like here that there's more money coming in than going out. You take the net difference, which is positive in this case, to the future. And that's also another really important thing, is that you have to use the net cash flow and not just the individual amounts when there's both an inflow and an outflow in the same year. Okay, so that's the note that's on the screen there. Use the net amount. So you're compounding the outflows, uh, the, the outflows, taking the outflows to the present and uh, inflows to the future. And then you find out if you move the amount in the future to the present, what interest rate is required to make it so that the absolute value of the inflows and the outflows are equal. All right, so... It's a four-step process. 
You can memorize those steps or maybe just through working several of these problems get used to it, but that's sort of a graphical representation of how to find the external rate of return. Again, there's two interest rates in this procedure. The first interest rate is the one that you are putting all of your extra money into. It's like the external bank account where the revenues are stored. And that first investment, that first interest rate is the external reinvestment rate, and that's what you use for steps one and two. And then you solve for the unknown. The external reinvestment rate is the first one, and it's given. The unknown is the external rate of return, and you solve for that iteratively to try and find out what is the interest rate that makes these two lines equal, the green dashed line and the solid blue one, both of them at the present. So here's just a, a formula that shows the uh, relationship between, in equations, the expenses and the revenues. You have to make them equal, and the expenses you first of all are taking to the present. Um, you're taking the sum of the, uh, if we go back to the diagram here, all the expenses, the outflows you take to the present, all of the revenues you take to the future, and there's two interest rates here. There's the external rate of return, which is unknown, and the external reinvestment rate, which is given. All right, so there is a uh, suggested template that you can use to uh, start on today's in-class exercise. And let me put that on the screen so you can start typing up the template that then you'll put the, uh, the data into. All right, here's the template. And this is going to allow you to apply those steps that were just shown. Um, in the activity, there's going to be a given external reinvestment rate and then a given net cash flow. And then you're going to have to be solving for, the unknown will be the external rate of return. This, this field will be the unknown. Um, some of these will be calculated, but the main thing that you're going to be goal seeking is you're going to be goal seeking the external rate of return, which is an interest rate. Everyone's got the, uh, the handout, right? The template's also on the front page of the handout. I'm going to start filling this in, so um, you know, keep working at your own pace, but you can glance up here if you want to see whether you've got the right information in the spreadsheet so far.
So once we have the sum of those present values and future values, we have to just start with the guess of the external rate of return. So let's say maybe 1%. And then what we're doing is we're going to take this 37,000 that's in the future, we want to take it to the present at this guess value of the interest rate. So if we're taking a future value to the present, the function for that is PV. We're trying to find the present value. This guess interest rate is the interest rate we're going to use. It's going seven years because right now it's at year seven and we're moving it to year zero. So I'll type in seven. Skip over the payment because it's just a single amount of 37,000 right now at year seven. So I'll do negative of that amount. So if we are discounting 37,000 to the present at 1%, then it's worth 34,000. So 1% is too small. Because what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to get these two to be the same. So what about 10%? Now 10% is too big. So it's somewhere between 1% and 10%. Okay, so again, what our objective is, is we want for the objective, the present worth of the sum of the compounded inflows, that's really a long phrase. Basically, we want to take these inflows that are all the way at the future, we want to take it to the present so that this amount equals that amount. So I'm going to use goal seek, data, what if analysis, goal seek, and then my goal is for this to be equal to, and I can just type in the amount, 25,928.60, and then I tell it the cell it should change is this interest rate. Tell it all right, and it should be 5.22%. So this is the answer of the question. The question overall is asking, what's the external rate of return? And what that means is it's sort of a weighted average because it's taking into account how much you make on your reinvestments, but it's also taking into account um, the size of your returns, the size of the inflow, how much the inflow amount is. So uh, it's a really important way of comparing alternatives because the external rate of return doesn't have the same limitation of the internal rate of return. That, um, you know, remember the internal rate of return assumes that all of your uh, cash that's being generated goes right back into the project, and this doesn't have that limitation. Now, it's a lot more, calc uh, a lot more uh, intensive to calculate, but it's far more accurate as well. Okay, so we need to move on to the next topic for today, which is bonds. If you're still working on this, that's fine. You can continue working. Um, but let's talk about bonds. Um, we briefly discussed before the difference between um, equity and debt. And equity is when you are investing in a company or in a venture as a part owner. Uh, a debt instrument, you're not actually becoming a part owner of the company, but rather you're just giving a fixed amount for a fixed interest rate. And they promise to return your original principal along with periodic payments over time. Um, the thing is, though, is that bonds are rarely held for the entire period that they're issued for. Some bonds are 30-year bonds, and they may change hands a dozen times before the bond finally matures. There's what's called a secondary market for bonds, so that at any time, if you're holding on to a bond that doesn't, exp doesn't um, mature for a lot of years in the future, and you need your money today, you could sell your bond to someone else. But the question is, how much should that other person pay for the bond? And um, the value of the bond is going to have two components. Because the, uh, the bond is paying back the original principal in the future, and it's also paying you the periodic uh, interest payments. And so that's what's labeled here as one and two. Those are the two components of the value of a bond. So the first part of it is about the redemption. This first formula here is saying you take some uh, future value and you're finding the present value of it. And so C is the redemption price. So the company that sold you the bond, let's say if you gave them $1,000 today, the most common theme 
is for them to say, I'll return that same amount in the future. And that's called the redemption price. And that's what they pay you at the end of the bond's life. And so to find out how much the bond is worth today, you have to discount that future amount they're going to return to you into today's dollars. And so that's why it's a P slash F operation. Now the second component of the value of a bond is those periodic payments that they're making. And so it's the interest repayments. One common thing is for them to give you the, the payments quarterly. So every three months you'd get some money from whoever issued the bond. But the value of those interest payments has to be discounted to the present as well. So R times Z is how much each one of the interest payments are. R is the interest rate and Z is the face value of the bond. So let's go back to that example of the uh, $1,000 bond that you bought. If it's a 3% per year and they're paying, the, uh, they're paying the interest once per year, then that would be $30 every year that they're going to be giving back to you because it would be 0 0.03 times 1,000. And so if it's $30 every year, then you need to find the present value of that recur recurring series of payments. And that's why it's a P slash A operation, is because there's an ongoing series, the same amount is constant, but you want to find out the present value of all of those interest payments. And so this formula is behind the second part of today's in-class exercise, which is on the back of the paper. Uh, if you're still working on the, uh, the first part, the external rate of return, definitely continue with that. But if you've already completed it and you found that external reinvestment rate and the external rate of return and everything settled, then you can move on to part B, which is this one. From the, uh, from the problem text, you need to figure out all of the variables and then plug it into the formula that's shown here at the top. And of course, the, uh, the interest table is provided on the back of the page as well. All right, so some of the key things to look out for when you're working with bonds is how many, uh, how many periods per year are there? Oftentimes there are four per year if it's quarterly, but this one was semi-annually, which means there's two periods per year. So always be on the lookout for the fact that interest rates most commonly are quoted on an annual basis, but you may need to calculate the interest rate per period if the bond is paying out more than once per year. And this bond is, it's paying out twice per year, which is why N is 20, is because there are 10 years, two periods per year, that gives us 20 total periods until redemption. Also, it's from the language that we found out that the face value and the redemption price are the same. That's pretty common in bonds. Oftentimes, they'll do that, but it's not always the case. Um, Sometimes they're different, but in this instance, they're the same. You just have to sort of read and interpret what it's saying. And so the overall value of the bond, $864, comes from two places. Remember, the two components of a bond's value is the present value of whatever that future repayment is going to be, the one-time lump sum that they give you at the end of the bond. That's where some of the value comes from. And then the other component of the value is what is it worth in today's terms all of those recurring future payments, that's the bond interest. All right, so I guess if I started early, I probably had better end early. I apologize for the uh, issues with the clock. I'll try and get that sorted out so I don't start class at the uh, wrong time again. Have a good uh, day, and I'll see you on Friday. Please bring your computers again on Friday.